Anya Grunman is Vice President for Programming and Audience Development for NPR, one of the leading creators and distributors of audio content in the world, no exaggeration. Anya leads NPR's Programming Center to create and acquire the highest quality content offerings that will engage and grow public radio's audience on member stations across the country and inspire new levels of engagement with audiences on digital platforms. There is perhaps, I wrote this part, there is perhaps no company in the audio space more invested in content and how that content will be consumed in the future than NPR. That's why I am truly, truly so excited to welcome Anya Grunman. I'm really happy to be here today. It's a really amazing time for audio. Right now, it's, uh, people are saying it's a, a golden age of audio and um, representing, I think, maybe the oldest company in the room um, that really got its start defining what audio could be, originally in contrast to what network uh, radio was in the 60s. Um, sometimes some folks call us, uh, call NPR sort of the old school, you know, legacy media company, but that's not really the spirit that drives NPR today. Um, and I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about the history of the organization because it's actually a phenomenal time in which different generations of NPR and public radio are sort of coming together um, to energize this moment. Um, <clears throat> NPR was founded around 1970 by a bunch of radical activists, uh, philosopher kings, and I would say um, crazy nerd folks. Um, we actually recently were looking back at one of our founding, at our founding documents because we were thinking about a mission for our organization. And we actually got really inspired by Bill Simmering who wrote the first mission statement for NPR because somehow it seems really relevant today. And so um, National Public Radio will serve the individual, it will promote personal growth, it will regard individual differences with respect and joy rather than divi division and hate, derision and hate, sorry. It will celebrate the human experience as infinitely varied rather than vacuous and banal. It will encourage a sense of active, constructive participation rather than apathetic helplessness, Bill Simmering. Um, in these times, right now, today, in the world we're living, we're living in, this is a really valuable thing to have as a force in our country around conversation, engagement, connecting people to people, conversations across the country and the world. Um, I, I, I think on top of this spirit, I'll tell you a few little stories. Uh, the first, for the first ever broadcast, they, they, there was some kind of demonstration happening or some riots in, the, in, uh, in, in DC, and they decided for their first ever broadcast that they would go out and do sort of, they would send people out that day and then come back and make the show. And so they were in the middle, like, there was like police and there was shouting and they, and they got all this stuff and then they actually didn't, they were, got so excited about making this really long form thing and they actually didn't finish it in time so they had five minutes of dead air on their first uh, broadcast. But it was a spirit of sort of exuberance and inventiveness and craft and delight that animated the beginning. And then another story I wanted to tell you, just some funny moments. I just read, there's a, there's a group called Former Nippers in which everybody who's ever worked at NPR is like following on a Facebook page and they shared from 1977, this is the nerd part, you know, the in 1970 the satellite system didn't exist and they literally got the broadcast out around the country by doing, um, by doing, uh, what do you call it, party line call? And they would call from station to station and they would set up the, the line. Well, in, and then, it was the engineers who actually helped figure out how to do this, uh, how to get a satellite network going, how to bring this stuff all across America to every nook and cranny of America um, without having to use phone lines. But um, this reminds me of sort of tech people today. Uh, in 19, somebody had an idea that they could create, I don't even understand this, but there was, they could create five separate loops of the phone lines in the country and they were gonna do an art project and they advertised in newspapers that everybody should call this number and whistle and they were gonna have different 
levels of phase levels in all different five parts of the country, and they did a two-hour live broadcast of five different sections of the country whistling. Um, we don't do that anymore, but <laughs> <laughs> that was tech meets uh, wonderful. Um, uh, so layered on top of that spirit, um, starting in the 80s, even uh, Ron Contra hearings, all of a sudden NPR started really investing in story. It, they were great storytellers at the beginning, but they started really investing in journalism and being a major news organization. Um, and that sort of, I think, creative spirit in inventing a new medium, um, being crafty about it, having a sense of let's put on a show, um, on top of investing in news and journalism over the years, a lot of print journalists were hired so that we would be able to do original journalism and we'd be able to um, uh, develop the credibility and trust that we have today. So I think there are these two points that NPR has about the spirit of inventiveness and being a major trustworthy source um, uh, of important information and delightful experiences that I think are coming together today. Um, so sorry, that was a long wind up, but here we go. So today, um, we have the largest audio first newsroom in America, reaching 26 million per week on the radio and 10 million plus every week on digital and web. We have the number one podcast network, um, according to PodTrack. We have a really flexible brand with our off the charts loyalty and trust. And actually, we, we saw some numbers uh, recently about our audience. Um, across our multiple platforms, we have now the same size audience above 50 as below 35. Um, so we are, the spirit of NPR and what we've been doing is really speaking to folks across generations. Um, and that's one of the things we're really proud of because we want to be starting conversations and having people engage about important issues, questions, fun things, um, not, on, not only with their own tribes, but across. And we have a powerful network that allows us to do that. Um, so we're, we have pretty simple goals. We want to make great stuff and we want to get it out there. Um, so we're always thinking, and I think pretty early on in, in digital, we also thought really hard about the levers that would allow us to succeed um, in the same way that we had to adapt to our first version of ourselves on the radio and, and, and invent that. Um, we continue to do that. I think we had one of the first, if not the first audio APIs. Um, actually, it was after one VP left and another one came, the director of engineering um, made our API. He's now uh, the head of tech at, at um, Netflix. But that allowed us to, uh, when Apple came with the first iPad, they called us up a about a month beforehand and they said, would you like to do an app for our launch? And we had like, I think it was four or five weeks. Um, and because we had that API, um, we were able to actually make that app within a month um, and fill it with ongoing content and it's still incredibly power, uh, popular today. Um, in addition, so today we think about how do we create content across our platforms, leverage the, what the platforms have to offer that allow us to rethink who we are on an ongoing basis. How do we express the essence of our brand and our opportunity and how do we find new ways to put it out there? So part of what we're trying to do, and that's helped us I think bring in the younger audience. So we think really hard about not staying still in terms of what content we're creating. Platform, we've made platform investments like the API over the years, and we continue to do so, that are really driving a lot of our ability to have scale and to connect with audiences all into car, everywhere we can think of to put our content, we're trying to put it there and we're getting it there, both on third-party platforms uh, through our entire station network and on NPR-owned platforms because our mission actually requires us to be open um, and to reach as many people as possible um, with work that will move, move them. Um, and then revenue, uh, we actually have a flexible 
um, and multifaceted revenue model that we've developed over the years um, and that we continue to push on. Uh, this is a very challenging time for everybody trying to make journalism, be able to support journalism. We've seen what's happened to newspapers. But um, we're really asking these questions and our adventures in digital are helping us find new ways to support our work and to connect with new audiences. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about con some of these content platform and revenue sort of intersections. Um, we just launched this podcast on Tuesday. It's still number one on iTunes. Um, this, is, this is a team that was brought to NPR a few years ago to have a discussion in social and on the web uh, around issues about identity and culture. Really important issue right now. Uh, really young, diverse team uh, in, two, in Washington and LA. They've been serving our national news programs and now we've created a content extension for them on a podcast. And we're really proud that they are going to be having open, generous, uh, conversations about what it means to be an American, what it means to live in a diverse society like we do, celebrate differences, and grapple with tough issues. Here's a platform that has really transformed what we're doing and thinking how we're thinking about our work. NPR One, has anybody heard of it? <laughs> NPR One is our attempt to do um, on-demand sort of uh, choice-based on-demand flow of spoken word audio. It has embedded in it all, um, it has revenue mo a new revenue models embedded in it. It has a relationship between our national network and our local stations embedded in it. It has uh, the potential for us to create new content. Uh, we're really thinking about um, a concept called skim and dive. How do, we, how do we put content in front of people that they can listen to choose, skip, and then maybe we can actually create things where there's a shorter version and a longer version. Every platform we're on has us asking these questions. How can we connect? How can we make really compelling content that will, be, that will make sense for the experience that we've been creating? And then the other thing that we're getting out of this is actually, you know, we don't get much information from iTunes. Uh, we know we have a lot of downloads and there's a lot of people, but that's not that helpful when we're thinking about content. Um, so there's a few really amazing people in the newsroom right now trying to see what we can learn from NPR One that will help us figure out how to make better stuff. And I asked one of them to email me some, some slides of things he presented the other day. Um, and so some of the things that are happening in our world that never could happen before, because in broadcast you actually don't get any information about what your audience is really like, except for doing some broad surveys. Um, uh, let's see. So they're doing A-B testing in NPR One. We're putting two different stories. Uh, and then we can watch the audience drop-off rate. So th what happens is the person, Sarah Saracen, who is in charge of editorial at NPR One, she sees this and she, she goes, who did that blue story? And then she runs up to uh, Morning Edition. She says, can't do that again. Don't do that again. That story had a terrible intro. Everybody's skipping. Um, so we've never had that before. And actually, people are changing the way that they write copy, changing the way they think about story structure, in some cases, because of this data that we're getting. And our uh, desire is to actually build a back end so any producer, um, who, any producer who, whose work is in here will get information about um, their content. Other third-party uh, sites aren't giving us this information, but it's really helpful to us as content creators. Um, here's, this is, um, this is Nick sent me this. Uh, how to do a winning intro. Start with compelling, exciting, scandalous. I have to do that in quotes because I'm not sure we're gonna do too much scandalous stuff, but, or newsworthy idea. Get to it, every piece is an audition. Pre-rolls, early funders seem to be okay. Those of you uh, in sales. Uh, a storytelling, podcast, a subject. And the hook is most important. We find that a lot of our um, podcasts that, that are around a theme and about helping people understand a concept and dive deeply into a concept that, that will help them think about the world in a different way or help them think about themselves in another way is a really powerful thing that actually is doing really well 
in podcasting. Here's something uh, that we're learning because we, you know, when you we have these two things happening with iTunes, people choose to subscribe to something and to download it. On the radio, you sort of listen to a radio and you're getting experience and things flow by. Those are very different user experiences. Those are very different ways maybe that you actually have to produce content for those different contingencies. So in NPR One, they've been testing how people got to a piece of audio and how it affected how long they're staying. Um, the top one, the green line, is people chose to listen to it. The blue line is people explicitly or implicitly subscribed. It's something we know they like, and so we served it to them. And the third one is we just played it for you in a flow and gave you an, a sort of opportunity to hear it. So they're not, it's not terrible, but you can see when people, I think this is probably obvious, but we're getting confirmation and when people really choose something. Um, I think I, I saw an advertising presentation once, you know, if someone has an option to choose something, they're more likely to like it and stick with it. Um, so uh, that's something we've learned. And then also, we're kind of unhappy with all the metrics that we have. We have skipping, we have liking, um, we have how long did people listen. Um, but they're, they're hard at work at creating something called a devotion score, which takes all of these things into account and really tells us how much people, how much people really are engaged with and are devoted to this concept or product or audio. And what you're seeing here we're still working it out, are podcasts from five different networks. Um, the smaller the box, the more sort of like very consistent the engagement uh, on the podcast is. Uh, that means it's something that somebody loves, they want to hear, and they just listen to it. And basically, everybody's listening to the whole thing. Uh, they're enjoying it. And the ones with the larger scores are where there's a lot more variability so that we can see we can also see, uh, like we sent, sent Planet Money the other day, a list of their 20, um, of 20 episodes, uh, some, like their 20 top episodes and their 20 worst episodes, and looking at the difference between those and seeing why some things are performing better than others. So anyway, this is a, an opportunity for us to be looking at um, and evaluating and sharing data that actually is helpful to content creators. Um, those are just, that's just a fun thing that's actually, that's permeating our environment right now. There's just a whole bunch of exploration on the revenue side, on the platform side, on the content side, um, that's really animating our work. And I think one of the things that we're really thinking about right now is um, there's a tendency, I think historically, um, innovation in large organizations is often put on the side because you need to isolate it. And often a lot of our work on different platforms in various organizations are like, there's the digital team and they're doing this thing, here's the podcast team and they're doing this thing, here's the, you know, here are these different folks, here's the people doing the radio and they're over here. Um, and actually one of the greatest opportunities that we have right now is to take the learnings from each of the platform in each of these groups and actually have them inform each other. Just like I said with the NPR One, that the data that we're getting from NPR One is informing our national radio broadcasts. Um, our podcasts uh, are actually changing the way our radio sounds. Uh, we have, in the fall, we launched a politics podcast with the politics team. They, within six weeks, they launched and they created a sound that it was different than you could hear on the national radio um, programs and our election coverage on the, on the radio. Uh, and this was the first time, this was really interesting for the organization because we had never done a really innovative sort of thing with risk attached in the dead center of our mission and, and credibility. And within six weeks they launched and we all decided they're, it's not going to launch perfect. It's going to launch on the run. And that team gelled. There's a young guy named Sam Sanders who's amazing. We think he has host potential. The next week, the newsroom heard the podcast and they said, do that on the air. Uh, then we were doing specials around uh, the primaries. And then the specials producer said, hey, guys, 
don't do that normal special stuff like I want the politics podcast team doing our specials on the national broadcasts. So I've never seen something launch so quickly but also infect the entire organization so profoundly and so quickly. Identify any new talent, new ways of, um, of connection on the air, uh, an openness. I, I think that the, one of the reasons we're doing this work, not only because podcasting is reaching younger audiences and is having us express our brand and our mission in new ways, it's also having an incredible effect on our ability to remain relevant on every platform. And so one of the things I'm trying to do is make sure that we're connecting, we're creating, we're thinking ecosystems, not, not silos, that, that we can learn a lot um, from all of the rabbit holes we've gone down, all of the explorations we've made, um, uh, and that will help us everywhere, everywhere we are and everywhere we go. Um, and we need to look holistically at it. And I think it also creates a great sense of energy for the entire um, staff. So uh, radio's not dead yet. This is share of year. Uh, share of year means how much time are people spending. So there's only a little bit of share of year podcasts right now, a lot on radio. But if you look at podcast listeners, they really love podcasts. And they also like the radio. And what we found, and this is about connecting, is that it's like a light bulb went off. We shouldn't be isolating these things from each other because this is the same audience. Um, it's, new, it's bringing new audiences in, but we did a survey, and yes, a lot of our podcast audience is listening to the radio. A lot of radio is listening to the podcasts. We're expanding our audience. It's growing. Uh, it's getting younger. Uh, and and we, can, we, can, we can develop new sounds and new ways of connecting with audiences that will speak profoundly to large audiences and also across generations. Our CEO recently sent out a note said, NPR is a rare and remarkable organization. We are a nonprofit. We are mission driven. We have a unique and flexible business model. We are a membership organization. We are innovating across platforms. These are reasons for our past success. And I firmly believe that they are the solutions to our challenges. Thank you. We have a few minutes uh, remaining. Um, this is an amazing opportunity to ask Anya. Anya, that was awesome. Thank you so much. This is an amazing opportunity to ask questions of Anya. We're not, we don't have her in front of us every day. So if anybody has a question, now would be the time. I want to start. Can I start? Yes. OK. Um, you indicated that there were a bunch of learnings. You showed a bunch of learnings that you had gotten from NPR One, from the digital side. I'm just wondering, are you getting learnings from Nielsen, too? Or are the learnings just digital? Oh, our audience on the radio went up in the last quarter, in the last ratings period, and it's actually going up. Um, and we're actually focusing on how, how can we continue to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so our national news programs, I think it went up, I don't know, Brian, did it go up 12% or something? <laughs> <laughs> Brian says up. Up 20%. I know we had a huge ratings actually increase, and we've been focusing, I guess we had been you know, we've been focusing a lot on digital, which has been tr really transformative and important for our organization. Um, but actually, um, our, our new CEO also said, you know, this is, this is really important for our future, but also let's make sure that we're thinking about that, that the radio is an amazing medium that we, that we can still make vital and that we can be one of those anchors that makes radio continue to be fabulous. Um, and so we're really thinking about that those connections. And I have one last question relative yes. to exactly that, which is that how do you navigate kind of the, the, the different incentive structure based on the relationship between the NPR member stations and NPR proper? Um, and I, 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 they kind of view you as something that they pay for to fund their content, and you have to live in that world as well as outside that world because your content reaches everyone irrespective of what station they happen to be using. So how do you navigate that natural friction and what's the future of that friction? Do you have an hour? <laughs> <laughs> no. I have um, four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, our member station network is the thing that creates an incredibly powerful, I mean, we have, because of our member station network, we have outposts in every community in America. We have 17 international bureaus, so we have journalists all over the world 
and we have journalists in every nook and cranny of America. And one of our goals, as I say, like thinking ecosystem and not silos, is often we've you know, not thought of ourselves together. And I think sort of nirvana for us <laughs> is how do we actually harness the power of that network across local, national, international. It's an untapped sort of resource. If, if we can figure out even new, some new funding models to do this, which we're looking at, um, you know, we have, in some cases where newspapers have gone away and, you know, there is no journalism, there's no coverage of state houses of any import. Um, basically, we have the potential to have the largest, most important network of journalists in the entire country. So um, that's, that's one way in which we're really working with the member stations to actually leverage the sort of national reach that, that we have and the local reach that they have. And, you know, we have a lot of conversations about this, but I think there's, you know, change happens in different ways, and I think everybody sees that, um, that there's not one sort of answer. You're not going to distribute only to one place. That being big uh, and going far and wide and connecting with audiences doesn't preclude also connecting with niches and connecting with your community, because each station itself is the voice of their community, and NPR really can't do that. So we're, we talk a lot about like where are the lanes, where are partnerships, and where are um, in our network where people can win and own and be successful, and where are the, the lanes. And we take it if we take advantage of everyone's strengths across the network. That's incredibly powerful. Will we ever get to a place, and maybe you've experimented with this already, where if I have a particular podcast that I love, that's an NPR podcast, I can actually give to the podcast and the station can get a piece of that action yes. by my support to the podcast. So NPR One, it started out as a pure news app and now it's 50% of the listening is to podcasts. And when we're moving on, we're about to do a, a campaign around it. And when we get to a certain uh, audience level, we're getting very close to the level where we can actually activate the monetization. When you have 500, 400 whatever partners making a meaningful uh, financial um, uh, you know, uh, contribution to defray their costs. You know, you have to have some scale to be able to do that. But um, Brian is working on, uh, from NPM back there, uh, is, is we're, we're working on ways in which people could donate and also uh, sponsors. Perfect. So that we're actually trying, this is the place, NPR One is a place where we've kind of replicated our entire business model on another platform in a different way. So you have the local national relationship that you have on your local radio station. You have, you're gonna have the opportunity to give if you love something. Um, and it will benefit the member station and the network. And, and there's uh, sponsorships, funders, philanthropy in there. There's local national content in it. And it's a place for content innovation um, and learning. So uh, it's, it, for us, it's a really exciting uh, project. Everybody, please thank Anya Grunman. <laughs>